let's start um, with health introduction. I'm Luca Toivonen, I'm a sociologist. Uh, I've also recently become a co-founder of Kansai Rise, and I'm collaborating with musicians in this area. Let's just get rid of my picture there, okay. Uh, but why am I here today? I started thinking about this yesterday, and I thought, okay, I'm probably here because of a long personal and academic journey, bit of a journey, I think. Um, and I'll just give you the very, very, very short version, to not bore you very much. Uh, so in 19, well, 1999, I was uh, 19, I boarded a plane to the United States. I joined, joined a great social enterprise called Up With People, uh, a musical uh, group, volunteering group, and we did home state as well. We traveled 70 cities around the world. And uh, that really changed my whole life. And um, one thing I learned there was to smile. And somebody today here was talking about smiling. Um, and um, Finnish people don't really smile that much. Perhaps we smile in the summer, but in the winter, we, things are cold. We don't really smile very much. That was coming out of the army, out of the military service. So um, the way for me to learn smiling was kind of pe peculiar. We had a director <laughs> from Broadway. And basically, he was telling me, you know, Tuka, smile more, or, or we'll figure out some kind of a punishment. And I ended up doing a lot of push-ups, because I wasn't smiling enough. So please help me smile today. So that was the way I learned smiling, so perhaps you can use that for your students uh, as well. Um, but, um, so that took me to America, and then finally to Japan, and I learned to smile more, with a bit more peace. And uh, basically I went to Japanese university afterwards. And I've now been writing about Japanese society, various aspects of Japanese society, for about 10 years. And in 2006, something quite peculiar captured my attention uh, back at Oxford. And uh, that was Japanese youth. And what I was seeing wasn't very pleasant. It was kind of shocking. Even. Japanese youth were giving a really harsh treatment in the media. They were considered slackers. <laughs> they weren't working as hard as their fathers and mother mothers were. Um, they weren't really contributing to society, it seemed. So they were called needs, they were called parasite singles, they were called hikikomori and so forth. So I was like, I was thinking, what's behind all of that? And fortunately I had a great supervisor, I had great colleagues, and we sort of dug into this topic, and thought about it for five years, interviewed people, and so forth. And as academics usually do, we came up with a book uh, called A Sociology of Japanese Youth. You can find it on Amazon if you write Japanese Youth Sociology, I'm not going to advertise it uh, here. Not much more than that, but basically um, that was the story and we figured out, okay, it's these groups making these problems. It's not the young people at all. The young people didn't really quite have a voice there. So that was that. Uh, but while I was in Tokyo and Yokohama doing field work, I also noticed another type of young, young person, another layer of young people. <clears throat> and that was kind of the uh, youth who were not seen as a problem, but the youth who were problem solvers. Uh, and I gradually came to meet many of these folks who were kind of rehabilitating needs and hikikomori through music sometimes, through theater, uh, through video, through agriculture, and so forth. And I got terribly inspired by these folks. And this lecture is really, uh, or this talk, is really dedicated to, to these folks. Um, and I think they are the social innovators. They're uh, part of the group of social innovators in Japan who will lead uh, that kind of social change in Japan and in East Asia. And I'll try to convince you today uh, that this is indeed happening. We're going to actually start with this kind of photograph first. Um, somebody was talking today about how boring classrooms are. But boy, are Japanese cafeterias pretty boring as well. Uh, as you know, you're not supposed to talk to anybody. You're supposed to sit down and shut up, usually or um, you're supposed to talk to the friends uh, you already know that you spend the day with anyhow. Uh, so you don't really see anything really special here. Um, but recently, by a curious flow of events, these sites have been linked to this kind of sites. Schools in places like Uganda and Malawi and so forth. Um, here we see a much more colorful environment, much more socializing going on, uh, elementary school. Uh, but a far less affluent, far less rich environment. So how has this happened? The answer is Table for Two International. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of this group before? Have you heard of this group before? Okay, not too many. Well, you might have actually 
eating their lunch. Um, Table for Two started in 2007 uh, from this kind of an awareness. Uh, we're living in a world where you have about one billion people who are eating kind of too much, who are enjoying their food, but they seem to be eating too much, causing obesity and so forth. Um, but at the same time, we have another one billion that is not eating enough. And this is not a matter of lifestyle. This is a matter of education and um, a matter of development. So they saw this gross food imbalance in the world, and they wanted to do something about it, and this is what they came up with. So this is the Table for Two model, and, and, and you can see this online if you go onto their site. And this is actually quite remarkable in all its simplicity. So Table for Two um, wanted, to take, wanted to offer healthy meals to people in the developed world, and in exchange for that, it's asking for 20 yen to be donated and to be then taken to Africa to poor schools there. So in a way, what they're saying is that we are connecting the world with just 20 yen. And uh, as we now know, we now know that this idea actually caught on. It really spread like wildfire. It was a really attractive uh, idea. And obviously, uh, Kogure san who's the leader, is very good with slogans. So he, he came up with this idea of connecting the world with just 20 yen and the saying that when you eat with table for two, you never eat alone, very fancy. Uh, so he came up with that. And what I want to stress today is that this is a global success model. A global success model from Japan. It could be from anywhere really, but in this case, it's significant that it's coming from Japan. And table for two now has operations in 10 developed countries and almost as many developing countries and Masa Kogure has been chosen as an entrepreneur, social entrepreneur of the year uh, by the Schwab Foundation, which is linked closely to the World Economic Forum. And because of this, he actually got to feed uh, all the finance ministers at the World Economic Forum last year. And he has delivered uh, food, uh, enough food um, uh, to feed 65,000 school children for an entire year in Africa. And he's also helped deliver 1.5 million meals in the developed world. And there are now 400 organizations that collaborate with Table for Two. I think that's quite remarkable, uh, an achievement. Okay, um, but luckily enough, there are many of these other innovative solutions uh, in Japan. Well, Japan is my field. I know this is a global, worldwide, worldwide phenomenon. But I want to focus on Japan here, partially because of this uh, bad reputation that Japanese young people seem to have in the media of this country especially and in the West as well. So we have uh, Funato's uh, Youth in 311 um, which is successfully dispatching young people to Tohoku to do volunteering there and it started doing this activity at a time when Japanese universities uh, many of them were actually discouraging youth from going to, to Tohoku. It faced lots of resistance uh, we have Oki's uh, Shiva Aru that provides sign language services through smartphones and, and through podcasts and so forth. Um, we have uh, Otsuka's Eko Towaza, which uses Japanese ideology, Japanese ideas and culture uh, to promote ecological consumption and, and internationally. And we have this great organization called Newbery, which is actually uh, providing cheap housing, affordable housing to budding manga artists. And these are the kinds of people that Japanese government doesn't usually support. So they're stepping in to, to, to help with this problem. Then we have Kudos, Sodate uh, Agenetto, we have Iwamoto's uh, K2 International that are um, supporting uh, unemployed young people, uh, socially withdrawn young people in many very intelligent ways. We have Kabakuchi's Home Door here in Osaka, which is trying to uh, solve the homelessness problem um, by also solving the abandoned bicycle problem. So they're asking uh, homeless people to actually manage a public a shared bicycle uh, system here in Osaka. So a lot of things happening right here. Uh, we also have the Edge, um, run by Mr. Tamura. So they're doing business competitions every year uh, to encourage young people to come up with their socially entrepreneurial plans. Um, we have World Campus International, which is actually creating trust uh, worldwide. It's bringing young people from around the world to Japan and Japanese host families. And then we have another type of social innovation, which deals uh, more with space. So we have uh, this Setakaya 
Monozukuri Gakko, for example, uh, which is um, actually which is running in, in an old school, which is not used as a school anymore. But it's used as a workshop. So there are architects, uh, there are artists there, there are scholars, there are freelancers there, and they're working together. And they're very open to the community. And in Osaka, we, of course, we have the Osaka space. And many of you may know that next year uh, there will be a significant new de development opening next to um, Osaka Station, which is called the Knowledge Capital. So uh, we are well set here in Osaka to push innovation, push social innovation, and I'm pretty sure Osaka, Kansai, Japan will, will not really lose out to places like uh, Harvard, places like Silicon Valley, uh, Oxford, and, uh, or even the startup sauna in Finland. So I think this place will do quite well. Uh, Okay, next, let's have a look at this. Okay, so why do I think that Japan's young adults will lead social innovation um, in this part of the world? <coughs> so I gave you some case studies there. I gave you some sort of examples. I just want to give a couple of big reasons here. And I really believe, and, and there's evidence of this here today, that Japanese young people in their 20s, in their teens, in their 30s, uh, they have tremendous expertise in design, tremendous expertise in engineering, tremendous expertise in social media, which is very crucial these days to, to making innovations and to spreading them. And this is perhaps the most shocking idea uh, to myself. If you look at statistics, uh, many more young people these days, people in their 20s, want to contribute to society compared to the supposed golden age of Japan in the 80s. In the 80s, about 30% said they wanted to contribute to society. Now about 60% of Japanese youth want to contribute to society. So I, I think this is really helping to clarify, to improve the reputation of, of Japanese youth. And obviously, Japanese young people will need to cooperate with uh, people from around the world. They'll be very happy to cooperate with people in Korea, in China, and so forth. Uh, but Japan has a special advantage of being relatively open. So basically here, the state is much less interventionist. Whereas in China, if you want to innovate socially uh, on a big scale, the state will definitely be there, defining that innovation for you. Whereas Japan is relatively free. So actually Japan is in a position to invite people from around East Asia, of course from around the world, to come here and, and innovate in the long term. Uh, and needless to say, Japan is a, is a very, very, very affluent country. So the resources are here. The people are here, the ideas are here, there are some challenges remaining, but that's what's happening. And finally, in terms of values, and these can be measured sociologically, values are getting more and more post-materialistic. And what that means is that there's a greater appreciation for, for arts, um, for environmental sustainability, for quality of life, and, and so forth. So we find uh, that Japan, in fact, is about 20, 30 years ahead of the game compared to uh, many of its neighbors. So Japan uh, has all the technology, it's ready to move to the next stage where we're not competing with GDP alone. We're competing on, on various indicators and we're using competition to promote uh, the ends that we choose together. So okay, that's the, those are some of the big reasons uh, for why I think Japan's young adults will lead. So let's look at, um, let's see how these people actually look like. Let's see some faces here. Uh, will Japan's change makers look like this? What do you think? Uh, they could in 30 years, I don't know, but uh, depending on, on various things. But uh, this Prime Minister, no doubt, of course. A change maker, of course. A big change maker in politics. Uh, perhaps the young people in their 20s and their teens in Japan, they feel awfully distant from this political world. They think it's kind of dirty. So they don't, and um, additionally, uh, they're actually in a minority. So it doesn't really make sense to try to work with the political system anymore. Unfortunately. Uh, what about this guy? Do you think future change makers will look like him? Uh, this is Horiemon, um, a business tycoon who tried to take over, who tried to challenge uh, Japan Incorporated, but uh, made a couple of mistakes, was brought down by the establishment. The young people are learning from people like him. What about like this? This is actually in Koenji, demonstrations in Koenji. Some young people are engaging in demonstrations in Japan, and very interesting demonstrations, very va valuable ones. But I have to say that these uh, people are in the minority. But if you just ask a Japanese person here, would they rather go to Koenji or to TEDx? Well, obviously in this case they would say TEDx, but if you just go to Osaka, 
and ask on the street, then very few of them would actually go and demonstrate. So, in their place, we have these kind of folks. Stylish, uh, smart, casual, uh, hopeful, full of ideas, pretty flexible, good with working uh, with various corporations, Microsoft, Apple, and so forth. Um, so it's these kind of change makers that, we, that we're meeting these days, and you could be one of them very soon. Uh, I have to mention uh, Furuichi Noritoshi especially on, on the right-hand corner there, because uh, I kind of took the idea for the name of this, um, I, I took the name of this uh, talk from his book. So his book is called The Happy Youth of a Desperate uh, Country. I'm calling these young people uh, the agile youth of a paralyzed country, kind of uh, doing a play on, on his title. Uh, but the remarkable thing is that uh, these young people are taking action. And they have many attributes, but I've decided to shorten and put all those attributes together and call them quiet mavericks. Quiet mavericks. Uh, so this is one of the words that I'm coming up with here today. Uh, so basically, um, they are unassuming, rather modest, very kind, good networkers. Um, uh, but they're articulate. They're able to come here or go there and give a great pitch and really sell their intervention. They have these special skills. They are good at writing books. They are good with uh, making their case. So this is the kind of folk I think we will see lead uh, social innovation here in Japan and uh, East Asia uh, for the time being. And uh, you'll be meeting many of them here today, I'm sure. Uh, finally, if I may do a little bit of PR, uh, well, I have to mention that obviously most of the people here, uh, most of us are living in Kansai or we're coming to Kansai periodically. We're engaging with this area, which consists of Kobe, um, Osaka, and Kyoto. So this area, unfortunately, is a couple of years behind, many years behind uh, Tokyo, in fact. So to overcome this, um, to actually speed up innovation, we're coming up with a new network called Kansai Rise. So please come and, and join this network if you're able to. Here's the URL. Uh, our next event will be uh, in May. And um, what we'll do is we'll bring people together to collaborate, to put their ideas uh, ideas together to, to enforce their influence. Um, so please join the other agile young people, people of various age, ages in Japan, and see you at the next Kansai Rice meeting. Thanks very much.